Welcome back to the show. Today's guest is Andrea Correa. We are trying something totally different here where we're literally recording the intro right after we did the interview. A little bit of background on how this conversation came to be, story time. Our office here in Seattle is downtown, and I don't live downtown, and parking sucks there. So I was getting an Uber pool to the office one morning. I get in the front seat. Someone from the back seat says my name, so I turn around, and it's Andrea. We literally hadn't seen each other for more than five years. We spend the entire Uber ride catching up up and we came to the conclusion that she just had to come on the podcast. So there's also talk of us working together on a pop-up here in the coming weeks, so stay tuned for that. Andrea herself has years of pastry and savory experience at restaurants like Noma, El Bui, Grace, which we were both on the opening team for, and more recently as the executive pastry chef at the Ritz-Carlton in San Francisco. But here's the kicker. When I asked Andrea when we were in the Uber where she's cooking now, she let me know that she had gone through this really exciting and fantastic transition in to the world of professional trapeze. So she's teaching and trying out for shows and learning the ropes, literally and figuratively, in that arena. And so we talk about making that transition, tips for aspiring chefs, and I say aspiring because we talk about young, just out of high school folks, as well as people who have had careers before entering the kitchen. We discuss her experience going from chef de partie to manager and what she learned along that journey, and even how trapeze and cooking are surprisingly similar. I've got a couple of videos here that I have uh, been playing for the folks that are on the video version. Okay, I'm going to get out of the way here please enjoy our conversation can we touch on this article yeah the article that he spoke about yes yeah yes uh yeah go ahead well i just because uh at the the underscore garnisher asks how hard is it to work for renee and you have this unique perspective where he wasn't renee redzepi from the new york times he was renee redzepi chef at noma uh in the kitchen all the time like you said he was at number 15 right on the list which, I mean, if we're talking, if we're really talking, back in 2010, people weren't paying that much attention to World's 50 Best. Yeah. Like, it was a list. It was definitely a thing. But people weren't holding it to the same regard. I mean, El Bui mattered, yeah. right? But not everybody else, really. Like, no one was talking about it. So what was, what was, have you been since? Because you were supposed to go to MAD, right? I went to MAD. Oh, you went to MAD. Last year. Sure. Just last September. Yes. And so... Did you get to go to Noma and see how it's changed? Because it's I totally did not. Different. Everybody wanted me to go, and you should come, and you should eat. But it was a really brief mm. visit, and I basically just got to go to Mad and spend a day in the city, walking around, and then got on a plane and came back to Seattle. Sure, sure. So this article that Renee wrote was effectively talking about how he was a bully in the kitchen, mm-hmm. and how he had this intense regret and resentment towards himself for how he treated certain people on his staff in the early days of Noma. Can you speak to that? Do you agree with what he said? Was he being too hard on himself? Was he not being hard enough on himself? No, I think he was being hard enough. (laughs) (laughs) Um, He was being perfectly honest. And yes, he, I mean, bully is a strong word, but he yelled at us a Mm -hmm. lot. And he was definitely um, a struggle emotionally to be in the kitchen and be, be yelled at the way he yells at people or watch that happen to others to the point that I, I would wake up in the middle of the night sometimes like with anxiety and yes. thinking like, um, is it going to be me next? Mm-hmm. Um, hoping that someone else gets gets to take the brunt of exactly. the of you. I, but he's also an incredibly kind human. Like, yes. you know, financially... My ex and I weren't doing great at the time and he was willing to give us food and, you know, feed us in any possible way that he could and help us in whatever way he could, given our circumstances. And he didn't have to do that. You know, he was he was a kind human being before he was a chef. And I really, really appreciate that. That being said, you know, everything he wrote in the article is true. And I also remember the moment that he describes in the article saying that he yelled at me and um you know he remembers some things differently like he never kicked me out of the kitchen i stayed in the kitchen i finished service but he screamed at me so loud that i was like outside of the restaurant and people you know the screams went through the kitchen into the dining room where guests could actually hear how, how how loud he was screaming you know and he was like so close to my face that yeah it's pretty intense wow do you do you remember what it was about or n- not that specific occasion, but when he would get very angry or when emotions would take the best of him, was it because a dish wasn't up to standard? Was it because cleanliness wasn't happening? Was it because he told you how to do something and you didn't 
like something else happened like it it was because things weren't up to standard and mm. so for the most part it was food in the dishes and so i remember him screaming at another chef because his butter emulsion was broken and we're trying to plate the vegetables that have been cooked in that butter emulsion but it's, n- it's not emulsified sure. which means that they're going to get cold faster and the texture in your mouth is not going to be what it needs to be mm-hmm. In my case, I mean, I remember vividly, he yelled at me about an asparagus dish that was a new dish, and we had, like, a 14-course meal for these VIP chefs that were coming in and scientists, and, you know, it's the first time we plate this, and we're plating it for a significant amount of people, and the asparagus did not look alive enough on a plate. Wow. You know, but that's a very broad thing to say what looks alive to me may not look alive enough to you correct and it's exactly what happened interesting so what is your reaction during that because i feel like there's a lot of people listening who probably had that happen to them last night or last week or last month and they i mean it truly does i've been there you've been there it causes some ptsd but you're able to talk about it now and I like I've mentally moved past some of those moments myself what have been two things in the moment what are you thinking is it constant apology is it just absorb it because you're confident in yourself do you take it and then deal with it emotionally later Mm -hmm. what what goes through your head when when you're that was exactly it. I just took it and I'm like, I'm going to deal with this later. I just, you know, we are still like our station still had to put up two dishes for this VIP table. And I'm thinking <laughs> my station is going down and we're out here. You're screaming at me. They need me. They don't know what half to me some plastics for the next dish. You totally. Know? Um, so he's screaming at me and I'm just thinking like, OK, let's get this over with so that we can finish service and finish it successfully. And then he gets more upset because he thinks that I'm not listening. Right. Um, and I was like, yes, chef, yes, chef. But it didn't matter what I said. It wasn't enough for him. And then mm-hmm. he got more annoyed because I said, yes, chef, yes, chef. Yes. And he was like, you're not listening to me. Um, I did the same thing, <laughs> if it makes you feel better. But it's a very, like, I feel like if I, you know, I'm not going to argue with him. There's no argument. No way. Like, that's just not an option. Mm-hmm. And so it's, I feel like there's no winning. No matter what I say, Correct. he's not going to be happy. Um, but yeah, at the moment I just kind of shut down. I listened to what he had to say and I just wanted to, for the scream to be over so that we can move on. Yes. Because at a certain point, those blow up moments are an amalgamation of emotions and you're probably tired and you probably had too much coffee that day and there's stress and insecurity issues of like, if I send the dish out like this, what are people going to say about me? And I put some trust in this person and I should have just done it myself, but I can't do it myself because I have 50 other things going on because I own Noma. I'm the owner of Noma. And so once you started to be a manager, did it give you a different perspective on why he would yell at you the way that he yelled at you? Or does, is it like this unforgiven, like you don't see the value in yelling at people in that way. That's a great question. <laughs> I I absolutely saw things differently. I don't justify it. I don't know that I ever yelled at anybody like that. Sure. Um, but I also, I mean, I don't hold a grudge. I, like, have a huge respect for Renee. And even after that happened, like, he called me right away and he apologized. And I knew he really meant it. Um and when I took him in a jury position, it was just like a new light yes. to an understanding of where he was coming from. The pressure is different and it's just like your name is behind anything that goes out of that kitchen and you want it to be as perfect as possible. And there's people are always going to make mistakes. And, you know, in your head or at least in my head, I feel like no one is going to do it better than I can. But you have to train your cooks to be able to do it better than you can. And it's, it's a struggle to f- be able to let go. Do you feel, okay, is there anything else you want to speak on there? Well, I did want to just touch briefly on the reason that you went to Matt is because they wanted you to speak about that article and bullying in general, because wasn't last year's theme, the culture of the kitchen or something along those lines, yes. right? What what happened there? Because um, they backed out. Yeah. 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 And, you know, it was a little, it was a week before um, and they said that they were in equipped to deal with you know having that conversation it was a little disappointing Mm -hmm. um you know but it 
at the same time it wasn't something like at this point i'm already doing flying trapeze i've kind of unplugged from the culinary world and all of these things and um i i feel like enough was said and done when renee wrote that article and it was published so it wasn't something that i felt like necessarily that needed to be stirred or that i needed to share more about what happened um but, but it was definitely it. disappointing that they just backed out the way they did and i still don't quite understand why yeah that's interesting but you're doing it now on the emulsion podcast so it's fine well there you go <laughs> exactly i like that yeah the whole story is being told now Eh? Eh? Did you enjoy that? I had a great time catching up with Andrea. We obviously jam on so many topics, and I really hope that the scheduling works out so we can cook together soon. Chances are, by the time that this episode goes goes live, that might have already happened. Uh, But regardless, I hope this conversation provided you some value. If you want to get in touch with Andrea, links for her are down low in the description, as well as uh, anything else relating to this podcast, as well as ways that you can support the show on sites like Patreon. Thank you so much for your attention. Please roll the outro.